I, I'd like to first turn to Dr. Witt, and if you could just tell us, you know, what, what is essential tremor? Sure. So first of all, about you know what is tremor? Uh, period. So um, a tremor is an involuntary um, oscillatory, meaning it goes back and forth in a certain vector uh, movement. That involuntary means you you don't mean to have this movement. You don't really have control over it like you would your other voluntary movements. And it's also very rhythmic, so that's another hallmark of tremor is that it's oscillatory, it's rhythmic, and it's involuntary. So what do we mean by essential tremor? Um, uh, because that word is used in everyday language in a lot of different ways, but in, in medicine we mean essential uh, tremor means that it's only tremor, uh, that you don't have tremor as a part of a constellation of other neurological findings because tremor can actually be part of other diseases um, that have tremor as one piece of it. Uh, whereas in essential tremor, tremor is the main central and often the only finding um, mm -hmm. classically described. Mm -hmm. However, as we've learned, um, there are actually some other findings that go along with essential tremor. Um, uh, frequently patients will have uh, ringing in their ears, will have hearing loss, may have some mild balance problems. Um, it may have some mild, um, what we call ataxia, or trouble with um, uh, coordination with their hands. Sure. So even though we've classically called it essential tremor, uh, sometimes the naming is, is uh, an evolving kind of thing. Uh, similarly, this has also been known as benign familial tremor, and a mm -hmm. lot of patients still um, have that diagnosis on their charts. A lot of doctors will still use that terminology. Um, but we're kind of moving away from that terminology as well because um, probably 50% of patients don't have a familial um, component. Right. Doesn't I mean, seem very benign either for exactly, a lot of patients. Exactly. That's, that's the other main point is that the term benign was used because it was not a disease that was thought to, you know, cause early mortality, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as we've learned and as we know from seeing lots of patients with tremor, that it can be very uh, disabling um, in many different ways um, from just a motor functioning kind of standpoint, using one's hands, um, driving, writing, eating, typing, using sure. a computer mouse. Um, it can also be very socially um, disabling. Some people feel um, isolated by their tremor. They may not go out with their friends. They may not um, try to uh, socialize in the workplace as much. And there's sure. actually been studies that have shown that patients with essential tremor, 25% um, of patients with essential tremor will retire early. Um, and wow. also 60% of patients with essential tremor will not apply for a promotion. So mm -hmm. occupationally, um, I think it's under-recognized as mm -hmm. something that is sure. not benign. So now, let me just ask one question. Just because you have a tremor doesn't necessarily mean you have essential tremor, right? I mean, there are, there's a um, physiological tremor that a lot of people have. Uh, how do you know if you actually have essential tremor as opposed to just a physiological tremor? Right, so that's a, that's a really good question, and sometimes there is a lot of overlap, um, and sometimes essential tremor will kind of start out with what seems like a physiological tremor. So what we mean by physiological is something that's not a problem, that's sort of within the normal spectrum, and any of us will have a tremor if put under the right circumstances. So if uh, you stay up all night working on a project or studying for exams and you've had 10 cups of coffee and you have a cold and you took some uh, mm. cold medicine, um, then you could have um, a little bit of shakiness. Um, if you are um, you know, up giving a talk in front of a bunch of people and they're asking you a bunch of hard questions, you might get a little bit of shakiness. And that's very common and, and it would happen to anybody um, who, who may not have essential tremor. Mm -hmm. Whereas with essential tremor, it's more constant. It doesn't necessarily have to be provoked by any of these particular stressors, although anyone with essential tremor will tell you under stress or anxiety or emotional conditions, their tremor will get worse. Okay. Um, but it's there more constantly, um, and it's also um, something that can interfere with everyday life, although it doesn't always, especially at the beginning. Oh. Um, so I think right now we're going to plan to uh, actually show a surgery that we uh, did recently on a patient. Um, this is a woman who uh, has a strong family history of essential tremor uh, and uh, underwent DBS surgery a number of weeks ago. Uh, this is patient Vicki and um, right now we're, this is the day of surgery and we have already obtained imaging an MRI scan of the brain and used that to make sure that she's a, a good surgical candidate. And this frame is what allows us to target our electrode to the exact location that it needs to be. 
it's very important that we get this uh, frame on correctly. Um, and in order to do that, we actually have to place four pins um, that go through the skin and, and are held to the skull very uh, rigidly. Uh, and so right here, Vicky is undergoing injection of some numbing medication, much like you would get at the dentist's office. And uh, once this uh, numbing medication is in, then we put in the pins that hold this frame still. Um, so right here, we're, we're putting on um, a box that enables us to uh, use the CT scan to know exactly where we are. And this is what we call a scout image, where we're just looking at her skull right here and making sure that we're going to acquire the right images that pass through the region of interest uh, that we use for targeting. And so you can start to see that um, this process is, is fairly complex. There is a huge team of people involved. Um, as a surgeon, you know, I'm really just one small piece and you can see we have nurses, anesthesiologists, uh, we have uh, Jenny Witt, our neurologist, often comes down during the surgery. Uh, we have radiologists that look at the images, technicians that help us, and it's, it's very specialized. It's, it's not any center, I think, has the equipment and the resources to really uh, get this done right. So with our patient, yes. um, as Dr. Gwynn is doing his targeting, which is a process that takes about 15 minutes, we're transferring the patient onto the operating room table. Uh, after placing a catheter to the bladder while she's sedated. For many people, uh, women and men, one of the hardest uh, parts of the surgery to kind of uh, get your head around, and that's the idea of shaving all of your hair, or at least getting a very, very short haircut. And again, we've tried different ways of doing this, but in general, I think it's best to just get a nice short haircut all the way over, and then after surgery, it will uh, grow back in again. And so, um, during this time, I'm doing the, basically the targeting, and we can hopefully show you uh, more specifically what I'm doing during this time. But basically, I'm putting the CT scan and the MRI scan together on our computer, and then uh, choosing the target with uh, what we call indirect coordinates, where we're um, uh, measuring from a certain part of the middle of the brain over to where we'd like to place our electrode. I think it's important to note, too, that the entire time you are operating, preparing, uh, getting ready to go, uh, we are standing there, as you can see Diana, to the patient's left, talking the patient through the process and the procedure every step of the way. And so here we are injecting uh, numbing medication in the skin uh, so that she won't feel the skin incision itself and we're kind of talking to her, trying to let her know that we're injecting the medication. And the anesthesiologist may well have given a little bit of sedation medication during this time as well. Um, we try not to use too much medication because that medication can actually suppress the tremor and make it harder to uh, know how, what, how well we're doing mm -hmm. once, once we place the electrode. There is, um, um, once we get through the skin, there's really almost no other part of the surgery that, that um, goes through anatomy that has pain receptors. And you can see here that we're uh, using a, a pen to mark the bone. Uh, you can see our, our cannula, which is that met straight metal rod that goes down. We're double checking that we're going right through the correct um, pathway to get to our target. So once we've created that little dot there, that's where we will be uh, drilling our hole and there is a, a, a fairly unique drill that we use to create a hole in the skull. We, the uh, burr hole as we call it is usually about the size of a, a nickel and um, there's a specialized drill bit that we use that has a clutch on it and this makes sure that the drill bit doesn't go too deep. And again it, it should not be that painful but the, particularly for the drilling, it is the noise that can be very, very uh, problematic for the patient if, they're, if they have never experienced something like that before. And so it's the vibration and the noise more than the pain that really uh, drives us to want to give that sedation. Uh, this is called the stim lock cap, and it basically locks that electrode into place once we have it precisely uh, located within the brain. So here, this is the uh, Lexel Arc again, and this has what we call a micro driver uh, attached to it, 
and that's the black thing that's just beneath my hand there. Uh, and right now I'm placing the cannula down through, making sure that it's going to go precisely through the hole that we've created and through the very um, exact part of the brain that I would like to enter with the electrode. Actually, we've placed the electrode uh, already into the VIM target, and we're now just connecting that cable that goes from the sterile part of the field to the non-sterile part over to Diana's controller here, and she's now just starting to turn on the stimulation. And you can see we're asking uh, Vicky to perform some actions that will let us know how well the stimulation is working. So it's, it's important to understand that we're, we're taking people through the entire range of possibilities that we'll do as an outpatient all within you know, 10 or 15 minutes in the operating room. And so we routinely uh, stimulate at levels that are significantly higher than we would ever anticipate stimulating um, once this procedure is complete. People are uh, quite happy usually when we uh, <laughs> tell them, okay, you've done a great job, you know, they really have to participate for a while and we need them to be very awake, but once that electrode is into position, then um, it's, we, you know, it's time to get them comfortable. So here we're now just washing everything. We use um, a saline solution that has antibiotics in it to try to uh, ward off infection and we're starting to put stitches in the skin. So um, let's go to the next question. Uh, can you explain the apparatus used in DBS surgery? And that's kind of a great segue. Maybe we can go over and show people what we, what we do in the operating room. Uh, this is the initial frame uh, that was placed. Uh, we can either change this arc uh, amount or we can also change this is called the, the ring um, measurement here. And so we can move in these two dimensions uh, with this arc without actually altering our eventual target at all. And this is the part of the apparatus that holds the cannula. This cannula then goes down uh, through the micro drive and enters, um, it, it stops a little bit above our target. Uh, and then through this cannula we will place either a uh, recording electrode and we can actually record from from one neuron uh, at a time uh, using this microelectrode and again we don't use this for patients with a central tremor uh, but we do use this for patients with uh, Parkinson's disease. Once we get the electrode into place we have a locking cap that closes uh, that locks the electrode down and then we basically disassemble this apparatus again. Uh, and this goes on top of the head frame. And when we get a slice, um, with we usually get every millimeter, we get a slice in the CT scanner. And as we get sequential slices, we have really three dots that we'll see on each slice. One dot here, one dot here, and then another dot here. And as we go up in the head with the slices, the location of this dot in relation to the other two dots changes. And that's what gives us our precise localization in three-dimensional space. This is what we call an axial section of the brain. And um, you can see here that our target is almost in the middle of the brain. So this is an area called the cortex on the outside. This is the frontal lobe here, temporal lobe, occipital lobe, and then um, this is called the striatum here. And right here, this area is called the thalamus. And the thalamus has many nuclei in it, many little discrete uh, centers of nerve cells. And the VIM nucleus is not marked on this uh, plate right here, but is right about in this area here. The system really contains three parts. And what we've shown so far is the implantation of just the um, electrode that goes into the brain. And that's really just one third of the total system. Here you can see this is the locking cap that is implanted in the skull. This is the part of the electrode that goes down into the brain. And then uh, this end of the electrode gets tunneled underneath the skin and is left usually in the back part of the scalp called the parietal area. 
And then at a second surgery, we actually connect this to another wire. This is called an extension lead. And then this extension lead goes down underneath the skin uh, down to the, what we call the clavicular area or subclavicular area. And we implant the battery right in this area here. And you can see here, this is the Activa SC battery um, that enables us to control the stimulation um, by route of this uh, extension wire. So, and then we also have here a uh, programmer that Peggy can probably tell you much more about, but basically this is the device that we use once we're out of the operating room uh, to finally manipulate the field of stimulation and optimize somebody's outcome. Now we can change the amplitude in addition to the polarity. The amplitude is measured in volts. We can change the pulse width, which is the um, hertz or frequency pulses per second. Um, or no, it's the pulse width is not the frequency is pulses per second. So we have those three different parameters that we can change to during programming sessions to help optimize the effect of stimulation and deter side effects. Just as uh, Jenny was talking about with medications, if you give somebody too much medication all at once, you can get a lot of side effects. Same thing with the programming. If you just turned it up to you know, a high voltage immediately that might be good for tremor control, suddenly you're inducing a ton of side effects at the same time. The brain does have to adapt slowly to the stimulation that you're providing. And so uh, we often will very slowly increase the level of stimulation so that those side effects are really minimized by enabling the brain to adapt to that stimulation over time. We actually have a patient, uh, Matthew Miller, who was implanted uh, about uh, six years ago now. Uh, Hi, great to see you, Matthew. Matthew I'm going to put you yeah. next to and, um, why don't I just let Matthew tell us a little bit about uh, his, his history here. When you first heard about brain surgery to treat tremor, what was your kind of initial reaction to that? I want that. <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw the demonstration at the seminar of, um, and you couldn't see what the doctor was touching to the patient's shoulder. You just saw his hand over his shoulder. And when he touched him, all of a sudden he stopped shaking. So as soon as I saw that, I thought, I want that. Yeah, yeah. So you weren't scared at all of, of the procedure? Somewhat, yes. But at uh -huh. the same time, I was willing to do whatever it takes okay. to be able to function again, to be yeah. able to work, to be able to eat, drink, shave, you know, all of your daily activities. Yeah, I, yeah, I was willing to do whatever. Okay. I believe drinking from a cup was one of the first things you had me demonstrate for you in your mm -hmm. office. Uh, this is drawing the spiral figure that you demonstrated during the surgery. Uh, this is what the device completely turned off, and I was illustrating what it's like to be relaxed when the, in other words, when you're relaxed, you're not shaking, and then I set up holding my posture so you could see what it was like um, to be able to sit up. This is trying to send a text message, again, on versus off. Wow. And this is just simply sitting back and trying to read a book. Very, you see, it's very difficult to even turn pages. Mm -hmm. uh, eating was always one of the biggest chores for me. Um, that, that's why, as you illustrated in your talk, that people don't go out anymore. You don't go to restaurants. You can't eat in a restaurant like that. Um, shaving every day, that, shaving still is a little bit of a chore, but much less than what it was. Mm -hmm. um, this would be just petting my dog. So you can tell she's a little bit irritated with the tremor side. Um, the other side, she was fine. She, yeah, she, she was very expressive in her face when it came to telling me, stop doing that. Um, again, very difficult to type on a keyboard turned off versus turned on. And this is something I have to do in my daily work.
I remember that very well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I remember, you know, you talk about the, the social stigma that's associated with this, and you've done a pretty incredible job in overcoming that stigma and really becoming, you know, a voice for this uh, condition. I need to share that with everyone. People don't need to live like that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Tom here asks, uh, what is the battery expectancy of the DBS? I had DBS last July and leave mine on 24-7. So, yeah, how long does it last? Well, I, I can answer from my experience. Um, I, I have uh, different degrees of voltage on either side. One is turned up higher than the other, so one didn't last as long as the other. I had one battery that was turned lower that lasted over six years. The battery that was turned up higher was about two and a half years. Mm -hmm. But again, I'm turning off every night when I go to sleep. For someone who's on 24-7, that's mm -hmm. going to be different. Right, right. Okay, Peggy, what do you think? We tell patients three to five years. Um, for the patient that called in with his question, I would really recommend turning it off at night. If it's strictly an action tremor and he doesn't have tremor at rest, he really shouldn't need it on, and that'll increase the battery life as much as 30% right there. And so I can actually show you when I turn on, the first thing it's telling me to do is run my checks. And so I will hold it up to the device on my chest. I will push the check button and it will check it and say mm -hmm. that I'm on mm -hmm. and it will tell me that everything is going okay. Great. The next thing I would do is actually turn the device off since it already said I'm on. Once I turn it off, you can see the trimmer comes back immediately. Wow. When I turn it back on again, the trimmer is gone. So it's just that simple. Did you feel it go on, Matt? Absolutely. You'll feel, um, now just for me, I can't speak for every patient, but yes, I do feel a surge go through my arm, whichever side I'm turning on or off. And especially with the head trimmer, too, I feel a little bit of uh, surge going through my midline. Before we, hold on, before uh, he comes in, I just wanted to thank Peggy for joining us today. It has been fantastic to have you, and she really is the uh, linchpin of our entire program here. She helps coordinate all of our patients, and we, we really appreciate having her here. That's right, and thanks, Matt, for being here. Absolutely, thank you. So next, uh, I'd like to introduce, this is uh, Dr. Ronald Young, and he is one of the three neurosurgeons uh, here at Swedish Neuroscience Institute performing deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, myself and Dr. Peter Nora and Dr. Young all perform this procedure, but uh, Dr. Young probably has more experience than any of us at doing both uh, this procedure, deep brain stimulation, as well as another procedure uh, that has been done uh, using a gamma knife uh, to basically perform uh, or end up with the same result. So thank you very much for joining us. Excellent. And I know that uh, you have just come from surgery uh, yourself right now, and, and that's why you couldn't join us earlier. Maybe you can let us know what you are doing. Uh, well, I actually was doing two things. First of all, I was changing a couple of batteries in a patient that has, uh, actually it's a Parkinsonian, Parkinson's patient, but I, uh -huh. I changed and put two new batteries in. And then after that, and in fact, he's in the machine right now, I'm doing a, a gamma knife procedure for tremor in a patient that I did uh, the one side on exactly to the day one year ago, uh, the 16th of December 2010. So we're doing the second side today and he's actually in the machine right now. We've done all the planning and he's having the actual gamma knife treatment at this moment. Excellent, okay. And we've been pretty much talking about deep brain stimulation only uh, up till now, uh, but there are other ways of treating essential tremor um, uh, using uh, techniques in the brain. And actually the what we call a thalamotomy uh, was a procedure that was done first that even that led us up to knowing that deep brain stimulation may help uh, and this is a technique where we create a lesion in a portion of the thalamus that same VIM nucleus uh, and nowadays there's uh, easier ways of creating this thalamotomy using a what we call the gamma knife and maybe uh, could we have you describe that to us? Yeah, um, Dr. Gwynn is absolutely right in the in the old days and I'm old enough to have been around and done procedures this way. We used to uh, do similar to what's done in DBS, uh, put a frame on, uh, do some type of planning, 
uh, put a probe in, but instead of leaving it in permanently, we would heat the tip of the probe and destroy the tissue around the tip of the probe in the same VIM area where the DBS is placed. But uh, beginning in around the oh, late 1980s and especially early 1990s, we began to use this device called the Gamma Knife, and, and I probably should explain what that is because to me it's obvious, but to, to, you know, to you in the audience it probably isn't. So it's called Gamma because it uses gamma rays. Gamma rays are generated by radioactive cobalt, and you can't see them, you can't feel them. They pass right through the body without you being even aware of it. And what we do in the gamma knife is form these gamma rays generated by radioactive cobalt into very narrow beams. They're actually four millimeters. These small beams are passed through the brain in such a way that they're all focused, meaning they all meet at the same point. And that point is the VIM area of the thalamus. And the whole idea of this uh, device is that we pass a lot of beams. In the case of the newest machine, 192 separate beams. They all come in from a different angle. And the strength, the radiation strength along each one beam is not enough to cause any harm to the brain. But as the 192 beams all converge on the same point, then they, over a period of time, and it's usually, oh, two to four months or so, the cells that generate the tremor gradually die off. And as they die, the tremor goes away. Um, and this uh, procedure has been in use now for almost 20 years. I did my first procedures with it in 1992-93. And my own experience is now well over 1,000 patients uh, with essential tremor treated with the gamma knife. The gamma knife, you don't get the effect right away. As I mentioned, it takes a um, couple or three months, sometimes even longer, before the radiation kills the cells and the tremor is affected. And then if there are going to be side effects, they take even longer to occur. Side effects take as long as six months to a year before they occur. And we'll talk about what the side effects are and what causes them. But, but you can't really do the other side for at least a year after the first side. And then you have to wait another two to four months to get the tremor control on the other side. So really, with uh, the gamma knife, you have to wait about 18 months before you can get both sides done. Mm -hmm. The other differences are that, as you've heard talked about, with uh, uh, DBS, you can test the effect. And you can make slight adjustments in the positioning of the electrode to try to get the best combination of tremor control and minimum or no side effects. You can't do that with the gamma knife. The, the planning of the aiming of the gamma knife is strictly based on MRI scans. So it's what we call anatomic. There's no physiological way, there's no functional way, like you can do in the operating room, to be sure with the gamma knife that you're in exactly the right place. And deviations of as little as a couple of millimeters can be the difference between a good result and little or even no result. But having said that, if you look at the outcomes, and I thought Dr. Gwynn was very, uh, I don't know if you want to call it conservative or liberal earlier, when he gave his uh, recommendations or suggestions about how likely it was that DBS would get rid of tremor, and I, I, I agree with him. I think maybe 70, 80 percent of patients will get what we'd say a good result. Not necessarily 100 percent tremor control, but like yours. I, you would be, I would say, a very good result. Not perfect, uh -huh. but very good. And I think the gamma knife results are relatively similar. Around 70 to 80 percent get a really good benefit. Um, and I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Young. I'd like to thank Dr. Witt, uh, Peggy Short, and Matthew Miller for all coming in. I'd like to thank the uh, Dystonia Research Foundation, the Tremor Action Network, uh, the Scientific American uh, website uh, for uh, co-hosting us today. And then I'd also like to thank the International Essential Tremor Foundation uh, for participating as well. Uh, we also have an entire team here of uh, folks, our communications department here at Swedish Medical Center, uh, Neuroscience Institute have been participating and they've been receiving your tweets and messages uh, all morning and have been uh, conveying them on to me so that we can answer your questions live uh, here online. Um, 
So again, just want to thank you guys very much.